Good afternoon, everyone, and um, welcome to my home study, um, and also welcome to uh, the second of our webinars on uh, after COVID um, rebuilding Australia and the world. Um, we're very pleased to um, welcome you and and talk about this production or publication. It was a book that was sort of um, set record times in terms of Aspie's efforts. Um, you know, normally a publication like this is a is a venture that we embark on over several months and um, with plenty of time. And in this case, um, it was four months, uh, four weeks, I should say, that from beginning to end. Um, and with that in mind, the real heroes of the publication um, are my colleagues who are joining me here today. Um, so our first off is Tom Uren, our senior analyst from the International Cyber Policy Centre. Um, Marcus Hellier, for a senior analyst at Defence and Security Program. Um, and Leanne Close, um, who's the head of our cyber centre, uh, sorry, head of our CT, <laughs> um, uh, but also has just recently joined us, and I want to make a special welcome to her. Um, so after 30 years of working, and I, I know people find that hard to believe that it was 30 years, but after 30 year career in uh, law enforcement, um, including holding positions as a deputy commissioner at the Australian Federal Police um, and um, DEPSEC positions at the Attorney General's department, um, she's joined Aspie to um, pursue all things counter-terrorism. And in the way Aspie always does, one of the first things she did on arrival is write a chapter for our publication. Um, what I want to do today is we'll have a sort of the, the way the process will go is um, we'll, do, we'll do a brief introduction now and some of the bigger concepts. Um, then I'll hand over to each of the the um, authors to really sit there and talk about this week's focus and their chapters, which really is, is um, you know, what have we got to do to return and provide national security? How has this crisis of COVID-19 changed our assumptions? Um, and also one of the issues that really underpinned our, the chapter itself is where are all the opportunities? Um, COVID-19, from my perspective, is, is really a, um, a once in a lifetime opportunity and it provides that. So it's a terrible crisis, but it's on the other side and the flip side of it. Um, it's a once in a lifetime opportunity to reconsider some of the um, underlying assumptions on national security amongst other areas. Um, and it's unlikely to ever have that that opportunity again. Um, and so from that perspective, it is an opportunity out of the crisis. Um, some really big concepts that we held true and dear um, were unpacked in this book and, and they were unpacked in the book because um, they really are being challenged. Just in time supply chains, for instance, um, with jet fuel security, um, it was always just assumed that, um, you know, our risk management skills and risk management was done at that level that, you know, we could mitigate minor um, disruptions and minor um, the realization of minor risks, and we could we could limit the impact of those. Uh, in reality, what we've found is that um, you know we're entirely dependent um, on the, the global supply chains. They're easily disrupted, um, and quite often we're in a position where we can't mitigate those effects. And we only need to look to the fact that um, who would have in December last year. Um, believe that we'd be in a position of sending Australian Army soldiers um, down to um, into Victoria to work in a factory to produce masks. Um, finally, I think that there's also a very finite window uh, with this crisis to really get things right. Um, you know, I hope that uh, you know this will be a very similar context as those as the post-war years that after the COVID-19 crisis it'll be a it'll be an enormous time of opportunities of nation building and starting again um, unfortunately if that is the case then we need to sort of move very quickly and making sure that we ask the right questions um, when we looked at chapters um, my co-editor Peter Jennings and I went around and, and essentially said to everyone you know what do you want to write on what's key and important we asked them to and we're very strict about it we wanted 2,000 words that made a um, a very clear impact on what government should be thinking about. Um, so as our most recent member of um, the ASPE team, I sort of wanted to lead off with um, and Leanne's chapter, and we've seen some significant changes uh, to policing at the state and territory level during, um, during this crisis. Um, and Leanne was charged or uh, charged herself with the challenge of going, so what does COVID-19 really mean um, for policing, what will come out the other side? So, Leanne, I guess from that perspective, what do you think are the key policy issues um, coming for policing? Thanks very much, John. Um, when I wrote the chapter and I was starting to conceive it, 
it was very early days in what we were experiencing in the world, and particularly in Australia, in terms of the impact of COVID-19. So uh, we saw um, certainly China, Italy, Spain, we were just starting to see the effects in the US and UK starting to emerge. Luckily in Australia, we haven't really experienced um, in policing the huge impact that it's had, I think, on those frontline services in the other countries. But that certainly shaped my thinking in terms of what would the impact be? Uh, and I've got three main findings in the chapter that I've prepared in relation to that. Uh, and I think obviously there'll be some other learnings that definitely need to come out of it. And I'll touch on that in a little moment. Uh, so the first part of uh, how to manage through the crisis and coming out of the crisis, I thought about the resourcing and the implications that was going to have. Uh, as people know, in policing, it's very much about just-in-time responses. There's so many different competing priorities that police are dealing with on a daily, sometimes hourly basis. They're moving from issue to issue. I think uh, one of the key ways that police are modelled to deal with that is something that we call command control coordination, the three Cs. So in looking and comparing and contrasting with, say, a defence model, I looked at how defence raise, train and sustain people. And for me, uh, the key issues for policing really are around, you have around 70,000 police officers in Australia responding on a daily basis. About 90 to 95% of those officers are on the front line operational uh, every day on their shifts and uh, dealing with response type issues. There's very little time or people available to think about the long-term scenario planning, training, exercising, to be able to take people offline and dedicate that time as defence do. So in, in a defence context, for example, there's just under 60,000 uh, uniform personnel. And at any one time, about on average 3,000 uh, of those officers are deployed offshore. Uh, they've got a huge uh, investment, and I'm certainly not comparing budgets here or suggesting that budgets need to significantly increase. I just think we certainly do need in Australia to invest more time, energy, uh, and people towards that sustainment and training of our officers to be able to manage any major uh, incidents and COVID-19 is a perfect example of that. The second uh, area that I looked at was just what, uh, what is going to come out in terms of the new laws. It was rapid introduction of uh, new legislation, regulations, fines being introduced and we saw some potentially overzealous officers, uh, but to be fair to them, really what they were experiencing was just um, a, a little bit of confusion because of the rapid nature of new legislation coming in, having to deal with uh, something that they'd never really experienced before in terms of the, the new social distancing measures and what that uh, means in terms of having to manage crowds or, or people in this sort of environment. They also experienced having to deal with um, putting people into isolation, say in hotels, which they've never done before. So uh, critically, I think what coming out of COVID-19 and, and where we're heading to in the future for planning is also around what have we learned? What are those new um, partnerships we need to enter into? What do we need to think about more broadly in terms of preparing police, maybe having standby emergency laws available when we do go to these emergency levels? Uh, and finally, uh, the, the last part of it for me was looking at a much more broad picture in terms of national security itself. We just experienced the major bushfire crises across almost all of Australia, but certainly down the eastern seaboard over Christmas New Year period. Uh, police were a key part of helping to uh, move people, um, get them out of danger quickly, trying to um, ensure that people were very well informed in terms of uh, evacuating themselves, etc. So there's dealing with those issues in support of other emergency services. Uh, and then when we went straight back into, sorry, straight into uh, COVID-19 responses, it brought to mind for me the fact that national security in Australia has been very much focused either defence and that external focus or um, very much on a counter-terrorism perspective. Now, CT is not going away, but we need to have a think about what's our national security policy posture for Australia. What does it mean in terms of new legislation uh, preparedness for dealing with whether it's major disasters, pandemics, or 
major terrorist incidents. Finally, on that point, I recommend the government has a look at development of a white paper for national security. And we've got defence white papers, we've had a really uh, excellent foreign affairs white paper produced a couple of years ago. For me, that um, discussion around what does national security mean for Australia? What do Australians, the community, business want to see in terms of Australia's policy response for national security? We've had uh, the Department of Home Affairs have been um, established for about two and a half years now. And I think it's time that we understood from them and that their role is really to develop some of those policy perspectives for government. What do we want to see government consider in terms of our policy response for national security, potentially broadening the definition of national security? What does it mean for investment and where we put our policies for Australia's national security over the next 10 years? Thanks, Dan. I, I do have one question, and this will probably help for some of the people um, um, who are listening in. Now, they, you know, you and I have worked through the various governments in terms of this. So we saw um, the Labor government and how gov oh, sorry, the Labor government and um, Kevin Rudd ex rapidly expand that national security. You know, everything was national security, mm -hmm. um, and we've definitely come back the other way um, fairly significantly, and especially if we look at the membership of say. Um, NSC. The, um, so, I mean, where do you sit on it? You know, how do we draw a line between what is national security and not national security, and especially from a policing perspective? You're right. We have to be careful not that it's so broad that it just becomes meaningless and, and unable and really unwieldy in terms of governing and um, a governance structure. I've certainly seen through my experiences of the Australian New Zealand Counterterrorism Committee the strength of having. Uh, your policy people, first ministers, operational and intelligence agencies collaborating together to come up with uh, really clear strategies, plans, uh, looking at legislative responses and working with government through those, that mechanism. If you do broaden out national security too much, you could dilute some of that ability. But on the other hand, I don't think that government has been looking at national security in a broader context sufficiently. Uh, and in order to get that good policy advice, good ideas about where to invest capabilities, have a look at capability development for the whole of Australian policing uh, and other services. I think that's that's where I'm going with the national security white paper. That gives people the opportunity to sit back, um, don't have to choose every idea, you don't have to make it that broad, but I think it's time that we do think about it much more strategically and long-term rather than just in time policing. Thanks, Leanne. Look, um, we might move on to Marcus. Now, Marcus um, volunteered to do two chapters, which I find, um, having done the same thing, I find incredible that he volunteered for it. Um, and I, preparing for today, I did say to him, I said, you know, how, how can you join your two chapters? One writing on um, defence spending and the ADF and the other one on um, secure supply chains. And he was quick to remind me that the two are so intrinsically linked. Um, so with that point of view, I guess... Marcus, um, hit us with all things national security um, and your chapters and the key messages you want to get out there. Well, thanks, John. Uh, I think you're right. There is a very clear link uh, between national security and supply chains and defence and supply chains. Be It's no secret that we import a lot of our military equipment and if that dries up, we won't have much of a defence force. But I think it's, you know, it's pretty important to remember one really key point and that is the, the biggest potential disruption to supply chains is war. You know, war is all about disrupting and rebuilding supply chains, buying your adversary's access to supplies and reshaping those supply chains in your own interest. So, you know, if we want to uh, develop supply chain security, a uh, key element of that is actually having a capable defence force to deter conflict and strong alliances uh, with like-minded powers to, you know, enhance that deterrence. So, you know, while we can talk about a whole range of, you know, security threats and threats to supply chains, you know, ultimately war is probably, you know, the biggest one in terms of its potential impact, which isn't to say we should ignore all of those other potential risks. So uh, there are some com common themes here, and I think, you know, one of the big ones that's come out of COVID-19 and to some degree out of the bushfire crisis before that is it's really reminded everybody of the centrality of the state 
in providing security. So I think, you know, maybe we sort of lost sight of that for a while, thinking that governments are really there uh, because they're good economic managers or they're about delivering tax cuts or budget surpluses. And But this has reminded us that the fundamental purpose of government is to provide security for its citizens. And if you look at the COVID-19 response around the world, it has been led by national governments virtually everywhere. Um, but it's also COVID has also, you know, reinforced a lot of the trajectories that we were well aware of already. So changing great power uh, balance, the balance of power, particularly between the US and China, you know, n like nothing before, you could say that, you know, COVID has really undermined the credibility of the US, uh, which is... Um, a big problem for, for us in particular, and I think will also lead to a kind of em, emboldening of China in China's aspirations. So it's a, it is um, definitely accelerating that kind of competitive tension between the US and China. Uh, it's also reminding us of the fragility of some states in our region and, you know, making us really think what would happen if uh, COVID was unleashed in our region and how would we respond. Um, and so I think it's really uh, reinforced a lot of the strategic uncertainty that we were facing already and accelerated that. In terms of, you know, well, what do we do about it from a defence spending perspective? I know there are a lot of people saying, well, defence, you know, as, as part of the economic pain, defence should take, share that pain and take a cut as well. You know, and, I, and intuitively you sort of go, well, yeah, but um, when you sort of look at it in a hard-headed, realistic kind of way, now is not the time to be um, giving defence a spending cut. You know, I've suggested we should be aiming to, you know, three, three point, uh, aiming to three or 3.2 per cent, obviously not overnight, but in the longer term. If we take a longer term perspective, go back to the Cold War and look at the uncertainty of the Cold War, we were uh, regularly spending, you know, two and a half and over three per cent during the Cold War because of that strategic uncertainty. If you look at where we are now, you know, what, what does it look like? Does it look like the Cold War or does it look like those happy days after the fall of the Cold, of the um, Berlin Wall of US multi, uh, sorry, unipolar uh, power? I'd say it looks a lot more like the uncertainty of the Cold War and we should probably be spending in that realm. Now, does that mean we should be spending on the things that are in the 2016 white paper? Um, my view is no, we need to have a really hard think about what we should be spending on. We shouldn't just be going ahead delivering the plan as it is. Uh, we should be having a really good think about if all of the capabilities in there are needed. And uh, to get to the supply chain issue, we need to be thinking very hard about um, resilience in the defence force, particularly supply chain and industrial. Resilience, and so that, maybe I'll use that as a segue to talk about supply chains. Uh, a bit. Well, I think, you know, if there's any good news out of COVID, it's it's actually shown that we're a pretty resilient state, you know, psychologically in our people, you know, our political system is, you know, pretty sound on the whole. Um, you know, so we do have resilience. We produce more food than we can possibly eat. So we're good on that regard. We've got lots of energy, obviously some problems around liquid fuel supply security, but on the whole, those we do pretty well on those those basics. So it's, you know, we've done pretty well there, but that doesn't mean we should be complacent. We should be looking at strengthening supply chain resilience. And I've suggested, you know, conceptually, there's three big methods to do that. The first one is diversify, diversifying supply chain. So where we get stuff from, and, you know, no, anyone who sort of looked at this knows that in a sense, the world is looking like that. Even before COVID, uh, US and European companies were realising they, realising they were overly dependent on China and were, you know, move, shifting production, bringing production back on shore or moving production to other countries uh, in Asia and Latin America to diversify. That's happening already and that's something that we can take advantage of. The second uh, means is greater stockpiling. 
You know, and stockpiling is, sounds attractive, but there are traps to that. A, it's very expensive, and B, often you stockpile a bunch of stuff, and then when you actually come to use it, you re realise it's been eaten by rats over the last 10 years. So, you know, if you are going to stockpile, you have to be willing to spend, but you also need to have a way where that stockpile is this flow through the stockpile. You know, so things come into it and they, you know, come out through the regular supply chain process for 10 or 15 years. But really, again, what is that? What does that mean? It means you're moving away from that kind of just-in-time model that we've been come, become used to. Industry will have to hold bigger, bigger supplies and, and there's a cost involved in that. And the third one is uh, the idea of uh, onshoring production, so bringing production back onshore and rebuilding your own manufacturing capability. And there are obviously strengths and weaknesses to that and, you know, cost is a big one. You know, if it was really cheap and easy to manufacture stuff here in Australia, we would be doing it already. And, you know, we've run down our manufacturing capability and there's, you know, the reasons for that are well known and essentially they come down to cost. You know, uh, we Australia couldn't make cars at a price that Australian consumers found attractive and that's the reason our uh, car industry died. So, you know, rebuilding will take cost and we'll, and the, the, the fundamental question is who pays? Who pays? And, <clears throat> you know, Australian consumers um, don't really like paying extra for Australian-made goods, um, as we saw with the car industry. So that, uh, how do you deal with that? And so the, the, the normal tool for doing that, that governments use, is the old fashioned one of protection. You impose tariffs on imported goods to protect your own industry. You know, and, <coughs> excuse me, obviously with globalization, that has become very unfashionable. So that's a big question uh, to ask is how are you gonna, do you do wanna rebuild manufacturing in the country? How are you gonna protect it? because it, uh, it may survive in particularly in high value areas, but in basic everyday commodities, you know, for hand sanitizer, if Australian hand sanitizer costs $5 and Chinese imported hand sanitizer costs $2, you know, your Australian consumer is not gonna to continue to pay $5. So there are some big, big questions there, but they are not necessarily insoluble. Anyway, uh, I'm conscious that I'm taking up everybody's time, but I'm, I'm happy to come back and speak more later. Thanks, Marcus. I did want to raise one thing, and this is, I did notice, um, I did notice within your chapter, this sort of discussion, especially the defence chapter, I should say, around uh, almost like you were suggesting a, a change or a shift in the paradigm of this sort of, you know, defence's 20th century engineering-based project management for all of this, looking, you know, building subs over 50 years. I mean, um, was that a serious consideration of, and is it a push for yours, you know, this, that they have to be able to adopt technology um, much more quickly than they are at the moment? Uh, yeah, look, I think, you know, one of the things that we've, we've, we've seen in COVID is um, this sort of ability for people to respond, you know, using 3D printing. And so there's all these stories of people 3D printing valves for ventilators and, and stuff like that. And you go, well, well, that's great. That sounds really good. Um, now, it's really hard to 3D print a submarine. It's really hard to 3D print, you know, a missile. Um, so 3D printing the answer, but it does sort of raise the, the issue of in a crisis, you know, and the, the next crisis could be a, a military one, how do you have a defence force that's resilient where you can build stuff, use it, have it destroyed, replace it uh, much more rapidly than we do <laughs> at the moment? So, you know, even if you have a submarine building capability that's up and running, it's still going to take you eight years to build a submarine and you're going to be totally dependent on imported components. So it, uh, the we, we do need to think, uh, change that paradigm to think maybe more about simpler equipment, stuff that you can build quickly, stuff that you can, you're happy to lose that can be destroyed because you can replace it quickly and cheaply. And again, that's going in sort of the opposite direction from the current military paradigm, which is to build ever more complicated uh, machinery, ever more complicated platforms that get bigger and, of course, more expensive. So we have fewer of them, which means we can't afford to lose them. So I think there is there does need to be a fundamental paradigm shift 
And if that doesn't mean to say we won't stop building manned platforms, but we need to really think much more creatively about how we can build stuff that we can do quickly and that we're happy to lose. Thanks, Mark. Um, Tom, you and Justin Peng uh, wrote our chapter on um, on cyber, for want of a better term, and you looked at the crucial importance of Australia's um, digital infrastructure and the extent to which we have failed to protect it. Um, I do note, and in fairness to you, um, I think at the early stage people were saying that, you know, a week in um, COVID-19 pandemic time was equal to a year. Um, I suspect that, you know, that was amplified up quite a bit in the cyber environment. So um, I do note that in your, you know, some time has passed since you wrote your chapter. So I'm happy to talk you more, happy for you to talk more widely than just your chapter. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks, John. Um, we really, Jocelyn and I really wrote about two related things and the, the common theme was that we need to be a lot more proactive in dealing with threats. Uh, so the first of those was, um, just critical infrastructure writ large. So particularly the thread we picked up on was a lot of concern around hospitals and hospital um, IT in particular. So prior to COVID-19, there have been a number of ransomware attacks in Australia on hospitals and medical facilities. And as the pandemic was picking up steam, there were, uh, quite a few people talking about how we just couldn't live with that. So prior to COVID-19, we could, we could literally live with a hospital being disrupted because of, um, because of ransomware. But in this time of uh, stress and, and shortages of, of hospital capacity, we, it's not acceptable. So there were, on Twitter, I noticed some Infosec people making vague threats about ransomware gangs. Uh, Secretary Pompeo came out and also levied some vague threats about consequences for actors who, uh, who are ransomwareing hospitals. Uh, what was really interesting was that in Australia, Linda, um, the Minister for Defence, Linda Reynolds, uh, issued a statement saying that the Australian Signals Directorate was actually disrupting uh, criminal gangs using offensive cyber capabilities. So that means hacking into them and disrupting their their infrastructure or uh, perhaps wiping boxes or, or something like that. So that was interesting. And I think that was a good move because probably like so much in the internet, a very small, relatively small proportion of people do the vast majority of the damage. So almost everywhere you look, uh, Google gets most uh, search traffic, Facebook gets a lot of social media traffic, and there's a very, very long tail of uh, uh, properties that, that don't get much at all. So if we focus on the criminals that we think are causing damage and do everything we can to disrupt them, including hacking. That seems like we could invest and get quite a good return on investment. So in the context of after COVID, uh, criminals are not an existential threat for Australia. Uh, they are a significant problem and we should certainly do something about them. But if we're deploying our best tools against something that's not an existential threat, I think we've got our priorities a bit wrong. And it also seems to me that when it comes to state actors, the same uh, distribution that I talked about earlier, where a small number cause a disproportionate amount of the problems, uh, it, it leads me to the same conclusion that we should find out which actor uh, that is conducting espionage or disrupting Australia and, and use offensive cyber capabilities against them. Now, whenever people talk about offensive cyber, they think of uh, power stations blowing up, the electricity getting cut, uh, planes falling out of the sky. And I'm not suggesting that we do any of that. What I am suggesting is that we take actions that are, are hard in a way to distinguish from normal activity on the internet. So boxes get rebooted, they get patched. Um, I, I'm, sort, I'm suggesting we find critical nodes in our opponent's infrastructure and, and maybe just patch them so that they can't use them anymore, uh, kick them off and make those boxes more resilient. So in a way, I'm suggesting that we, we actually do some work to clean up 
a very tiny part of the internet to make it a lot more difficult for our adversaries. Uh, another second part, we really talked, Jocelyn and I talked about the infrastructure that underpins the internet. Um, so in COVID-19, so many people are working from home and essentially living on the internet and, uh, and doing their work from the internet. And so much of that is underappreciated from a government point of view. So Australia being an island nation gets somewhere around 99% of its internet connectivity from submarine cables. And although telcos and operators spend a lot on physical security, um, that, that extends about as far as the edge of the ocean. And there's a whole lot of undersea cable that is literally undersea. Uh, but it's more than just protecting cables underwater. It's about having uh, regulations about insider threats. It's also about having um, international agreements and trying to get everyone to operate on the same playing field. So people tend to forget about that aspect of the internet because it is literally out of sight, out of mind. Uh, but there's stories of cables being tapped uh, under the sea as far back as the late 1970s. So certainly any motivated state has the capability to disrupt and uh, interfere with those cables if they want to. Uh, you did ask about what I would talk about differently. Uh, and I, I think one thing that's uh, been raised recently is uh, uh, Labor talked about it in their discussion paper, and also Telstra has talked about what they've called cleaner pipes. And it's, uh, to me, the fundamental problem in, in internet security is that capability and motivation are misaligned. So, so there's some very capable organizations who just don't care because they don't understand. Uh, there's many people who care but don't have the capability. So that might be all of small and medium enterprise across Australia. And we have a tiny, tiny minority of people who are both capable and motivated. So the, the big banks, some other organizations who take the time and effort to defend themselves. And I think the government needs to play much more of a role in bringing capability to those who can't protect themselves and making the, the capable um, I guess, responsible for their actions and holding to them account if they're not making uh, the right investments in cybersecurity. I think the ACSC needs uh, a much more outward looking uh, agenda. Um, so one thing that struck me during the recent crisis was there was a lot of talk about how appropriate is Zoom as a video conferencing platform. And the ACSC did produce and it was a good piece of advice on how to assess uh, video conferencing software. What, what are the things that you need to look for? But unfortunately, it's advice that, a, that only a very tiny proportion of the Australian population can actually use. It's anyone who has probably actually done that work already and figured out uh, what platform they're gonna choose. Uh, and it was really just a list of questions. So I think they need to really push those boundaries and try and come up with something that's actually more useful for people. Um, so instead of just a list of questions, perhaps a table associated where um, there's perhaps some answers as well. Now, um, I could, and I'm sure before the hour's out, there'll be, uh, Tom, there'll be someone who asks about uh, about the COVID safe app, but I'll save that for someone else and of those questions. <laughs> I will sit there and that'll prepare you for it, no doubt. Um, I will say to you though, I mean, um, for those non-cyber people, digital resilience in Australia, what, you know, what does our report card really look like? Are we, are we doing okay? I think one of the things I think about a lot is a, a digital divide. Uh, so here in Canberra, my kids have been using Chromebooks for a couple of years, several years. Yep. Uh, and so my youngest who's 10 is quite well set up for at home to do schooling at home. Uh, but there must be, um, and, and so I'm very fortunate to be able to not think about that too much, but there must be literally hundreds of thousands, if not millions of kids who aren't as well set up. 
Um, and I think that is a real key part of resilience. It, it's not resilient if half the population can't access those uh, resources. Uh, and sp speaking of the COVID safe app, uh, I, I also wonder how many people have smartphones that could actually run that kind of, uh, that kind of app. Thanks, Tom. Um, look, I had I had actually planned to, to again use the uh, facilitator's prerogative and ask a whole pile of questions, but um, we've already got some really good ones coming in, and I'm, I'm just trying to sort of sort them in some um, semblance of order. And I think we'll start off with um, Doug, uh, Dougal Robertson asked about 25 minutes ago. He asked the whole panel, which is, has COVID changed the national security environment, um, or is it simply um, complicating factors? Uh, in the existing national security trends and issues Australia is seeking to understand. And um, now, Dougal, from my perspective, and I, you know, I'll talk about transnational serious organised crime and um, and a few other issues. And I, I, I guess from my perspective, I think it is changing the national security environment because a lot of the assumptions we had, so even if you were to look in um, around transnational serious organised crime, the assumptions we had there was that um, you know, the Mexican organised called cartels would continue to dominate transnational organised crime for years to come. Um, all of a sudden, we're seeing mass production coming out of um, out of the Mekong sub-region. Um, we're seeing, um, you know, a level of industrial uh, production of uh, methamphetamines and other synthetic drugs not seen before. Um, we're seeing in um, other parts of Australia and other issues. So, for instance... Um, Right now, with the unemployment that has been driven by COVID-19, um, predominantly young people, um, our exposure in terms of um, in terms of radicalisation, be that um, being radicalised by um, radical Islamic viewpoints or extreme right-wing viewpoints, um, you know, we have a large number of very young people in, who are very disgruntled, who are likely to be opened up to um, further. Um, or the potential of being radicalised. So I suspect that there have been some seismic shifts in that scale, nature and, um, and risk level associated and threat level associated with um, our national security in Australia, and that does need a, a rethink. But I, I'd like to hand probably over, maybe we'll go to Leanne next because um, she came out of that environment more recently. I mean, I mean, has it really changed the national security environment, Leanne? Yeah. I don't think COVID is changing it as much. Um, there'll be implications for it, of course, but I certainly think the political discourse in recent years, and, and we're seeing that nationalistic um, response. We've seen the response with COVID-19 and the, the closure of borders, the supply chains that uh, Marcus talked about a short time ago. That's certainly having an impact on people's psyche and thinking about Australia's place in the world individuals. And as you mentioned, John, I'm wondering whether the right-wing extremist movement that um, we haven't seen a lot of, it certainly exists in Australia, is that nationalistic approach um, going to change uh, post-COVID and through the political discourse that we're hearing and that rhetoric across the world? Uh, so I think there will be um, impacts, but I'm not sure how much the uh, pandemic will change that or not. It's a little bit too early to tell some of the implications because the borders are shut, we don't know what um, impact there's going to be in terms of unemployment, trade, other things going forward. Those sorts of factors, how it's affecting individuals in our economy and our society, that will definitely have an impact on policing and national security. Thanks, Leanne. And, and Tom, Cyberworld, has it changed? I think there'll be a couple of things that change. So one is just the nature of how people work and that'll actually open up more opportunities for us to be attacked. Um, the other thing that I notice that's not perhaps um, tradition, what, it, what you'd call a traditional cybersecurity um, issue is that the power of the big internet companies is actually increased relatively. So this is a terrible time economically, but they're actually faring a lot better than uh, other companies. So for example, the Australian, um, I think the Australian news landscape will be decimated, uh, but properties like Facebook and Google are doing relatively well. And in fact, Facebook is, um, Facebook and Amazon are, are massively investing to, uh, to reshape their capabilities. So I think in the context of last year's 
uh, digital platforms review. I think much of that will need to be revisited. Uh, I think the the traditional news uh, media in Australia, which has such an important role in a democracy in keeping people informed, uh, will really need a different funding model than what was proposed at the platforms review. And Marcus, from your perspective, has it really changed national security or are we all sailing subs into the future? Uh, well, I think, it, as I said earlier, I think it has reinforced trends that were there already, if were global trends such as US-China power balance. Uh, so I note Dougal's question is, says, is it a, simply a complicating factor? I'd argue it's actually the almost the reverse in a sense. It's been a very clarifying factor. Mm. Uh, it, it has added, it's brought clarity to a lot of this stuff. It, you know, it's reminded governments that what is their true role in life? You know, and you see it here with our, our government. All of a sudden, you know, uh, it's this idea of balanced budgets is put on the back burner and they actually need to spend money to provide human security, whether it's to save lives or to actually keep people at work or, you know, keep people fed. You know, it's it's provided sort of clarity and, and direction there. And I'd argue it's also brought more clarity to um, sort of the traditional national security defence kind of debate, um, made people, I think, a little more aware of the... Uh, uh, in a sense, the uncertainty that is coming to um, our region uh, strategically. Uh, it's interesting if, you know, recently there's been a number of commentators have put some quite different arguments out there about, you know, strategic futures and US-China. Um, so Hugh White, for example, you know, the, the Aspie Cowboys, as we were termed on the weekend, and even the person who termed us Cowboys, uh, are all essentially saying we need to be investing more in defence, you know, because of that uh, uncertainty. You know, so um, there is, it's sort of, I think, despite the fact that people may have different views on where the US and China are going, for example, there is a kind of consensus there, at least in the, you know, policy commentary the, that um, we need to be doing more in that space. Thanks, Mark. Uh, I do like the... Uh, the, the idea of that the clarity provides us, which is your word, uh, an ability or an opportunity to rethink stealing from Tom, which will probably go into some strategist piece in the autism future. But um, I do think, you know, back to the introduction I did at the start, which is I do think that this is a really good opportunity with that clarity to, you know, have a rethink about the assumptions that underpin our, our understanding of national security. Um, what I might do next is I've got a question here from, uh, for Tom... And it is, uh, what proactive measures could we take to tackle cybersecurity threats to Australia rather than passively defending from Jess Payne? Yeah, so I guess I talked a little bit about this uh, previously. So the, the one step we've taken is to use offensive cyber against criminals. I think there's opportunities to employ that more broadly, but um, that has to be a very tailored activity. So we need to figure out who are our biggest threats, where we would get the most bang for the buck and where we can do that safely. And I think we should do that more. Another big area of opportunity is trying to align uh, capability with the people who don't have it. So that might uh, mean um, encouraging or even mandating that telcos and ISPs provide some sort of security for people who cannot do them do it themselves. Um, on the internet already, there's uh, Google has safe browsing, um, which is basically um, each, all the major browser manufacturers don't allow you to just hop onto a site they've determined is bad. They'll actually warn you and try and stop you. So I think there's initiatives like that that could be distributed more broadly. Um, I think there's an education piece. Uh, I have mixed feelings about education because um, some people uh, just don't care um, and it's really quite complex. So after having spent 20 years in the field, I kind of uh, I'm in the unfortunate position of thinking it's easy, but I recognise that for many people, no amount of education will, um, it, it will never solve the problem for the whole economy. No, no. And, and um, 
I was going to say something else, but it's escaped me. So I'll stop there. <laughs> but look, I was going to taunt you back. You know, I, I had having worked for a number of um, AFP commissioners now. You know, I, I'd always been a fan of um, of offensive cyber uh, against criminal targets. It's hard to get criminal targets where the likelihood of prosecution was, you know, really was uh, pretty low overall. But I think over time, though, now. And especially the longer I'm out of government, the less comfortable I am in with that. And I think that um, for a variety of reasons, I think that, um, you know, there is a judicial system. And, and normally, for instance, if you were to commit a real world crime, you would be prosecuted on the basis of um, the, the burden of proof would be beyond reasonable doubt. Um, and I'm always uncomfortable with a change of that burden of proof and a change to the, the, the underpinning values of our justice system to be applied to criminal activity using that even when that criminal activity is as um, reprehensible as child exploitation for example yeah so i think there's different uh opportunities there um so i wouldn't suggest that we go around uh destroying things or blowing up uh, machinery. Uh, and I guess the example I gave was one where you're removing malign activity, you're not causing anyone any harm, and you're not actually even causing the criminals necessarily any harm. You're just making their job harder. Uh, so I think there's a line that I would feel very morally comfortable with. Um, and uh, in terms of public policy, I think it was a bad decision to announce that we were going to do it yep. uh, because I think it sends bad signals to other countries. But having announced that we're going to do it, I think we should go the whole hog and say, here are the kinds of things that we're actually doing. They're not destructive to anyone else um, and try and put a um, to, to put some bounds around, around what we think is acceptable behaviour. Thanks, Mark. Um, look, I actually think we've got to, that we cannot have a um, cannot have a webinar like this without asking uh, Marcus this question from um, Aspie's Luke, um, which is: Will Australia's Hunter Class submarine program end up being cancelled, or will the government push through with it? Great question. So, uh, look, the government has has already explicitly said since uh, the COVID outbreak started that it is going to continue with both the future submarine program, so that you know fifty slash eighty billion dollar program, and the future frigate program as well, where that thirty five billion dollar program. Um, you know, and you and you can see why they want to do it. Um, you know, if they stop doing it, it's you know there's people out of work. It doesn't fit their narrative of getting people back to work. Um, and both the government and defence have got huge amounts of credibility invested in both of those programs. If they turn them off now, it's a huge hit to their credibility. Um, so I think there is huge uh, inertia there. It will be very very hard for the government to turn those programs off now will they end up delivering you know 12 submarines in the long run or nine frigates in the long run you know that the 12th submarine is a long way away at the current schedule it's you know 2054 when that when that's meant to be delivered so a lot can happen between now and then both technologically uh, wise you know so I, I wouldn't be putting any money at all on uh, the government 12 submarines, you know, by the time we get to that point, it could be you know, swarms of underwater drones, it could be anything. But um, I'm reasonably confident that the government will continue uh, at the moment with both of those programs. But what I have also argued is that, um, you know, if, if Defence was a business, you would say it was heavily over leveraged, heavily over committed in um, acquiring traditional manned platforms. So things, ships, submarines, spider planes, all of those very expensive traditional platforms. Um, I think any any business would be looking at that position and say it has to diversify. There's too much uh, risk involved in, in focusing so much uh, effort and investment on those platforms. So it needs to be uh, investing much more heavily in alternative paths, and some of them could be Tom's offensive cyber capability, you know, but also um, uh, unmanned autonomous systems, whether air, surface, underwater, uh, and developing. Um, be because it's pretty clear to me. Okay, either manned platforms will 
be relevant or they won't. For them to stay relevant, they need to be integrating with autonomous systems, you know, so they need to become sort of motherships for, you know, swarms of underwater, of unmanned systems. If they're not relevant, it's because they've been replaced by swarms of autonomous unmanned systems. So either way, we need to be investing in those alternative emergent technologies. Thanks, mate. Look, we have a question here from um, Robert Vine, and it's originally for the whole panel, but I think it's a good one for Leanne, especially given her comments about um, around uh, NSC and the counterterrorism arrangements. And it goes a little bit like this is, um, has COVID reminded us that national security is a far broader remit than that of defence? And therefore, spending on national security should increase, but the percentage of defence spending within national security programs would decrease. Um, <laughs> this, should, so, this should be a good one because I think Marcus will have a response to the end afterwards. <laughs> that would be great to hear. Uh, I'm probably not going to comment on defence's budget. It is substantial compared to policing budget. So I think um, with defence, we're looking at about 38 billion, give or take a few hundred million. Uh, and a rough calculation for the whole of policing budget only. I haven't looked at other law enforcement agencies for Australia is around 14.4 billion. Uh, obviously, the the types of technologies and capabilities defence need are different from a policing and national security sort of context. Uh, certainly, though, in terms of the first part of the question around national security definitions, I think we do need to start thinking about national security more broadly again. I can go back to the bushfires, to national emergency situations, counterterrorism operations, and, and now dealing with the pandemic. That is around our, Australia's domestic national security posture. What do we want that to look like? But also more broadly, and there's another question there around um, South Pacific and how we might be able to assist our, our near neighbours and, and be conscious of supporting them. When you do look at China and the impact China's having across um, the Asia Pacific region and Indo Pacific region right now too, so so yes, I think the the definition should be broader. Uh, I'll leave it to uh, Marcus to talk about the defence budget potentially. <laughs> Come on, Marcus, you can't leave it hanging. So you're tossing at me. Look, <laughs> look, yeah, look. The defence budget is very large compared to other elements of the national security budget. I mean, you know, and I'm certainly not saying you should spend more on defence uh, at the cost of policing or at the cost of health. Uh, you know, it does raise those issues of, well, who would pay for more defence and how do we pay for it? Um, you know, and I think, you know, one of the things we've seen out of COVID is the government sort of realised that, you know, maybe um, budget surpluses are not the highest priority in the world and not necessarily the, the main thing that government should be aiming for. You know, I would also point out, um, you know, you can see this as maybe special pleading, but the, the defence budget um, as a total of um, public spending is only about 6 to 7%. 6 to 7%, not 67%, 6 to 7% of, of spending. And so if you're talking about broader human security, broader resilience, there's a lot of other areas in that uh, spending on that. So whether it's health, whether it's infrastructure, you know, that, that's all sort of been covered in that broader uh, Commonwealth spending already. So um, while I, you know, I'm not saying you should spend everything on defence, you know, I don't think necessarily you should be reducing the defence budget to create more resilience in the health sector or the infrastructure sector, for uh, example. But yeah, I, I'm the first one to say, however, that using defence to do some other kinds of tasks is not value for money. So, you know, using defence, the defence force to do firefighting, for example, is not necessarily value for money. And so, for example, if you're trying to work with um, neighbours in the South Pacific to develop greater resilience or security, you know, um, it may often make sense not to default immediately to the Defence Force, but, you know, to the police force or other parts of the government are actually better suited to that and actually uh, a more efficient uh, value for money way to do that. You know, I do think we tend to default to defence for things that are not necessarily, you know, um, in, it, in, in its remit. And, you know, as much as I admire the Australian Federal Police, they, they don't have the ability to sink an enemy sub. So, <laughs> <laughs> Having said that, though, I mean, two things on that. I mean, I've been advocating... Um, 
for a number of years that there's a there's a part of this is a need for at the high level a need for a, a, a dialogue and a um and a national security strategy more broadly for australia but separately from that um is that the undoubtedly there's never been a policing white paper really in Australia in a, this that sort of sense um and so Marcus and I, I'd ask I, I, before we sort of talk about that though Marcus would I mean does tying a, a percentage of the GDP to things like you know outside of just um defense does that really work from your perspective so you know like would we turn around instead of the budgetary process we have at the moment say well we're willing to spend you know 05 percent on law enforcement in Australia of GDP no, I'm not a fan of uh, percentages and percentage targets. I'm not a fan of setting the defence budget at a as a percentage of GDP and, you know, setting any other part of the, the budget as a percentage of GDP. I mean, you have to look at your threats, you have to look at risks, you have to look at your strategies to, you know, it, it comes down to, you know, strategy equals aligning ends, ways and means. You know, what are you, what's the end you're trying to achieve? How are you going to do it? How much do you need to spend on resources to, uh, to achieve it? You know, and those ends will always be changing. And so um, as the strategic circumstances change, so resourcing will need to will change as well. And so hard percentages don't take into account the dynamic nature of national security and they don't take into account the dynamic nature of policing threats or the dynamic nature of cyber threats. So I'm not a fan of hard percentages. And you mean white paper for policing or no white paper for policing, you think? Uh, well, we're living in this wonderful federation of Australia. And so, of course, why I looked at um, a white paper, potentially in national security, it ties it to a whole range of different issues, including policing, but policing is not the only thing that should be considered here, but it certainly should be taking into account the great success we've actually seen. One of the positives coming out of COVID-19 has been that national cabinet approach. Now that haven't always agreed, and that's been a real strength of the national cabinet and the strength of federation. You get that contest of ideas, you get um, different perspectives, uh, where it has felt a little bit is certainly some of the messaging coming out, but that's just been clunky because of the, the rapid nature of where, what we've experienced in rolling out new things. So I don't think you need um, necessarily a, a white paper on policing. You certainly need to have community views. You need to take into some of the issues that um, Tom was saying before around how much privacy, how much, uh, how much limitation on people's uh, liberties are we willing to accept in Australia, hence that comprehensive national security review, I think those sorts of issues could be covered in that. Thanks, Leanne. Um, we've probably got one more and there's a short question here. Tom, is the Internet of Things being, feeds being tested and reviewed? And that question is from uh, Robert Ralph. Um, I guess the Internet of uh, the short answer is, I don't know, the Longer answer is uh, there's two competing uh, trajectories going on. So one is the the Internet of Things. So you know maybe your fridge. They typically are built with just terrible default security, and there's more and more devices that are out there that people don't even know have internet connectivity. Um, so that's the bad side. There's more vulnerable devices. So you know every household probably has half a dozen. And on the good side, there's uh, big players like Microsoft and Amazon who are building um, basically development kits with security built in. So the question is, is are, are the forces of good going to get overwhelmed by the forces of evil? And the answer to that depends on whether you're an optimist or a pessimist. And of course, being employed by a national security think tank, it, I feel like it's almost incumbent on me to say that we're in terrible trouble and we need to spend more effort looking at providing incentives for companies to use those, um, those security by default uh, development kits um, and perhaps uh, having some sort of standard that they need to be baked into your equipment. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. Look, we've run out of time. I wanted to um, first off um, thank my colleagues. Um, there's nothing worse than being asked to write 2000 words on an incredibly difficult topic, project to the future and identify what government should do in sort of seven days or less. Um, and then, 
and then survive the rigors of you know of peer review um editors etc and for that i'm um and i know peter jennings as well we're really grateful for the work that you put into the publication um, i want to thank the people who've um, signed into this webinar um you know giving up their lunch hour and joining us in our home offices um, which hopefully soon will be replaced by going back to work um you know, I pick up on your point. Someone, one of the questions we did have that we didn't quite get to was, you know, was was I being overly optimistic at the start? Um, you know, I, I've been uh, working before I came to Aspie. I worked as an intelligence analyst for almost twenty five years, um, and I'm a cynic and a pessimist by nature. Um, and by, uh, by coming to a think tank, I should be, um, you know, I should be even more pessimistic. Uh, you know what? I I feel really optimistic about this. You know, the COVID nineteen is a terrible global tragedy. Um, However, after COVID-19, um, our book, it, it showed a whole range of opportunities for this country. Now, um, some, you know, some commentary might say, you know, that, um, for instance, uh, some of the questions here might turn out and say, are you being naive? People are more interested in, um, are more interested in uh, going to beaches and pubs than they are in building national resilience. Um, I, I'm not sure that's universally true. I think there are many Australians who are concerned about going to beaches and pubs. I think there are also um, many Australians, probably not as many, who are interested in national resilience, uh, cyber security, whether or not we're spending 50 billion um, or you know 90 billion dollars on submarines. Um, so I, I'd like to sit there and be more optimistic about it and say, you know, we really do have a great opportunity um, to build out of this crisis and do something different. Um, and speaking of which, and before I write up, we we'd always designed this that um, COVID nineteen. Um, and as I said before to Tom, you know, like a COVID-19 day is infinitely, um, you know, shorter than a normal day. You know, like everything changes so quickly. Um, so we'd always intended to do two volumes and they couldn't cover the same ground. So uh, right now, my colleague, Michael Shoebridge, um, is pulling together and Lisa Sharland, they're both pulling together um, after COVID volume two, which is a much more um, outwardly focused look about how we engage with the region. Um, and in that point, I guess the success of, of COVID-19 and, and what we're doing here is, is that um, and this is also part of that um, optimism, is that this is really about a, the beginning of a dialogue. Um, and you can see here we have, you know, a lot of continuity in thinking about, you know, now is an opportunity for a rethink. There's more policy clarity, etc. cetera. Um, but equally, we've got, you know, differing opinions and people are debating about, you know, what should be spent on where and how. Um, so within that mind, you know, I think that's at the heart of, of good um, think tank activity, which is driving that policy discourse and discussions um, and playing the game and not the um, player. So on that note, um, I'd like to thank our audience and thank my colleagues and have a wonderful afternoon and return back to work. Thank you.